two psychologists and a hot tub. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to today's episode of Two Psychologists and a Hot Tub. We're your hosts, Megan and Deandra, and we sure have an exciting show for you today. Two psychologists and a hot tub. <laughs> So this afternoon we have two wonderful psychologists on. First, we're going to have Abraham Maslow talking about his learning theory, and then next we're going to have Albert Bandura coming in, Alberta native. It's going to be a really good show. Woo! Woo! Oh, wonderful. Well, let's get right into it. We're going to start out with Abraham Maslow. <laughs> Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Maslow developed a list of needs that he then put into a hierarchy. He believed these needs applied to all humans. These are broken down into lower level needs that first must be achieved in order to gain access to higher level needs. After its publication in 1970, Maslow's hierarchy has attained worldwide popularity. This hierarchy is often depicted in a pyramid format, although Maslow never indicated such specification in his theory. Self-actualization is described by Maslow as the realization of one's potential, expressing one's creativity, quest for spiritual enlightenment, and the pursuit of knowledge are all examples of self-actualization. Maslow identified lower level needs in the hierarchy as deficiency needs and higher level needs as being needs. Deficiency needs are required to survive, feel safe, have a sense of belonging, and gain self-esteem. Once these needs have been met, the motivation to fulfill them lessens, and then the individual may move on to fulfilling being needs. Being needs include intellectual achievement, aesthetic appreciation, and lastly, self-actualization. Unlike deficiency needs, being needs can never truly be fulfilled, instead inspiring further growth intellectually. For example, the more successful you are as a teacher, the more likely you are to push yourself towards improvement. One criticism for Maslow's theory is that not all individuals act in a way that aligns with his hierarchy. Most humans move along a continuum, jumping up and down levels to achieve goals. Self-determination theory modernizes the idea resonating with the hierarchy of needs by instead focusing on motivation in relation to human needs. This theory brings a student's whole life into the classroom, allowing deficiency needs to be fulfilled before attempting self-actualization. For example, a student's survival and safety needs takes precedence over being needs until they have been fulfilled. Alright everyone, let's welcome our first guest, Mr. Maslow! So Maslow, can you uh, tell us a little bit about your theory here? So my theory is the hierarchy of needs, and I published it in 1970, and ever since then it's been really popular. Oh, wonderful! Wow. That sounds really interesting! Super cool! Could you maybe elaborate on that a little bit? Is it organized in any specific way? Sure, so it's basically a level system. So people decided to put it into a pyramid, which I'm not really, yeah, yeah you've probably heard of it. Yeah, we have, yeah, yeah. Now. I'm Ring not really cells. into that because that's not how I envisioned it, but I guess when you have a theory as amazing as mine, it's just how it goes. That is fair. And so what, now, what's in this pyramid? So it starts off with the basic deficiency needs, and you have to complete one level in order to move to the next level, so move up the pyramid. So what, I guess. So the deficiency needs are physiological, which would be your basic needs like food, sleep, water, all of those things. Then it moves on to safety and security, which are pretty self-explanatory, and then sense of belonging and esteem. That's the last one in the deficiency needs. And then after that, it moves on to the being needs, which is only actually one need, self-actualization, and that's the top of it. So it's categorized kind of in two main sections, deficiency yeah. needs and then the being needs. Yes. Okay, and you, you used a term, self-actualization. What does that mean? Self-actualization is more of academic or intellectual achievement, I guess you could call it. So the bottom deficiency needs is 
what you need to survive and to have a good life. Whereas self-actualization, the top level, is what you need to further yourself intellectually and to make your life better, I guess you could say. So it would be self-efficacy, be an example of self-actualization. Great. That's so, wonderful. Yeah, I, I think we understand your levels, but can you give us an example, um, you know, of how they work in real life? Kind of explain what you're saying in, in real life terms. Okay, yeah, I can do that. So, imagine you're a teacher, okay? So you're in a classroom situation, a classroom scenario. So, how are you going to get, let's say, Billy, or how are you going to get a student to understand what you're teaching in math that day if he hasn't had breakfast? Oh. So, you can't get Billy to do the Pythagorean theorem if he, all he's thinking about is being. Yeah, that makes sense. That that could happen at, at, for any age of a child. Yeah. And you know, I feel that that example is relevant in the classroom at any age. So, one final question here in our interview. Um, are there any criticisms to your theory? I don't think so. Because it's, I think it's really like the best theory that's been made so far, obviously. I mean, that's why you guys have me on the show. Absolutely. Yeah. But, where it, there's one criticism that says that not all people react that way. So some people complete multiple levels or multiple goals all at once. So they have different motivations. You know, thank you so much for joining us. Two psychologists and a hot tub. Albert Bandura. In Bandura's social learning theory, behavior is learned from the environment through a process of observational learning. People actively process information around them and think about the relationship between their own behavior and the resulting consequences of that behavior. Bandura made a clear distinction between inactive learning and observational learning. With inactive learning, interpretation of consequences are seen as providing information. Observational learning or vicarious learning is learning by directly observing others. While observing, a person focuses their attention, constructs images, remembers, analyzes, and makes decisions, all which affect learning. By distinguishing between the acquisition of knowledge and the observed performance based on that knowledge, Bandura suggested that we all may know more than what we show. This could be seen in the 1965 study with the Bobo doll. The study also showed how incentives can affect performance. Even though learning may have occurred, it may not be demonstrated until the situation is appropriate or there are incentives to perform. Bender's theory later developed into the social cognitive theory, which retains an emphasis on the role of other people serving as models and teachers, but also includes thinking, believing, expecting, anticipating, self-regulating, and making comparisons and judgments. It addresses how people develop social, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral capabilities, and how people regulate their own lives and what may motivates them. His theory describes a system of three factors that are continuously influenced by one another. These include personal, the physical and social environment, and behavior. The social cognitive theory has two key elements, observational learning and self-efficacy. Observational learning has four key elements, attention, retention, production, and motivation and reinforcement. Attention is necessary in order to learn through observation. As a teacher, you need to ensure your students pay attention to critical features of the lesson, presentations are clear, important points are highlighted, and always to demonstrate when possible. Before a person can imitate behavior, they have to remember it. Mental retention can be improved by mental rehearsal or actual practice. Even if a person knows how a behavior should look, they still may not know how to perform it smoothly. Practice, feedback, and coaching are sometimes needed before a behavior can be reproduced. After a new behavior or skill has been acquired, a person still may not perform that behavior until there is some motivation or incentive to do so. As teachers, observational learning can be used to direct attention, fine-tune already learned behavior, strengthening or weakening inhibitions, teaching new behaviors, and also arousing emotion. The second part of the social cognitive theory is self-efficacy, 
or our own personal beliefs about our competence, effectiveness, or capabilities in a given area. It focuses on your attention to accomplish a task with no question as to whether you can do it. Mastery experiences are our own direct experiences, and they are usually the most powerful source of efficacy information. Vicarious experiences are the observation of someone else's accomplishments. The closer the observer identifies with the model, the greater the impact on self-efficacy. Social persuasion or specific performance feedback can lead to more effort, attempting new strategies, or trying harder to succeed. Self-regulated learning integrates much of what is known about effective learning and motivation. Bandura believes that the goal of teaching should be to free students from the need of teachers so students could learn independently. This allows a person to learn independently throughout their life. Two psychologists and a hot tub! <laughs> Welcome back everyone! This is our second psychologist of the day, Albert Bandura. Let's give him a round of applause. the observation of others um, but it developed over time just like all good theories do and uh, now it focuses um, more on the cognitive aspect as well as learning through uh, observation of others. So that can be anything from um, uh, just direct observation or inactive uh, observation um, things like that. Oh great! Cool. Wonderful! Awesome. All right so now I need to ask can you explain the difference inactive learning and observational learning? So um, inactive learning is learning from um, the consequences directly resulting from your actions. Oh. So that could be anything from like stubbing your toe and then having it hurt. Gotcha. Oh, that's so, great. And then, um, observational learning is learning through others. So seeing a behavior um, that somebody else performs and the consequences from that behavior and seeing like the result, like what oh. the consequences. Fabulous! Thank you so much. That really clears things up. Yeah. Great. So, quick question. What was the Bobo experiment all about? The Bobo experiment is um, one that I did. I'm probably the most well known for it. Um, it involved um, an inflatable clown doll, like, kind of like this shape, um, and we called them Bobo. And we got uh, some preschool children. We split them into three groups. And before they interacted with the actual Bobo doll, um, they each watched a different video. So we had a model, or the person who was uh, in a room with a Bobo doll, and they each performed a different behavior. So the first group um, was very violent with the doll and punched and kicked and um, got rewarded. So the next, um, the next model with a Bobo clown in that video um, punched, or no, sorry, um, yeah, not violently punched and kicked the doll, but then uh, was uh, directly, um, they had, there was consequences, so they, they were punished for their behavior. And then the third uh, the third person um, was not either punished or punished. So um, after the, each child, each group of children watched the video, they went into the room with an actual Bobo doll. And uh, like just like I my theory states, it's each child experiencing a different or learning through observation a different aspect of the model and the Bobo doll started to behave in that way. So the ones who were positive, like positively reinforced, were much more violent than with the doll. Um, the group of children who watched the, um, who watched the, uh, the person be uh, punished for, for their behavior, they were the least active with the doll. And uh, in the middle, with no punishment or reward, they didn't really have to punish the doll. That's so really kind of cool. interesting. Kind of like a monkey see, monkey do type. Yeah, very neat. Thank you so much for clearing that up. All right, Vandura. So we asked this question to Maslow earlier. 
Could you explain your theory with an example in the real world so that our viewers kind of get what you're saying here? Sure. So um, imagine that you yourselves are teachers in a school sitting, and I'm your student. And if you are um, up at the front or wherever in the classroom and you're exerting awful behavior and being very rude and negative and everything um, along those lines, what do you think your students are going to learn from? So, if you're a model and you're exerting bad behavior, your students are going to do the same thing. They'll do that or they'll have the other effect where they won't do anything because they know that they're going to get punished for participation. Mm, that makes Again. sense. Oh great, thank you so much. Just yeah. one last thing to clarify. Would this be the same for all students, K through 12, or does it vary oh, by grade? No, absolutely. It's true for all people. It's oh. true for animals in the wild. It's true for you and me and sense. the audience here. Wonderful! Well, thank you yeah. so much for joining us today. Thanks for coming. Ah, great. We're going to have you back with Maslow. All right. All right stay tuned. Two psychologists and a content. It is! The connection between Bandura and Maslow. Even though Bandura and Maslow's theories on social development are distinct, they contain some clear similarities. Observational learning is covered in depth in Bandura's theory, but is also involved in Maslow's hierarchy. Bandura states that children may pick up behaviors through social situations, such as with their parents at home. Maslow believes that the first two levels of needs, physiological and safety and security, the two that are typically covered at home, must be met before self-actualization and academic success may be achieved. Self-efficacy is our own belief about our competence or skill level in any given area. For Bandura, self-efficacy relates to the ability to self-regulate learning and learn independently. He believed that this is important as the goal of teaching, for him, is to eliminate the need of a teacher. Maslow's idea of self-actualization is that it is an all-encompassing term for self-fulfillment and the realization of personal potential. This clearly relates to Bandura's idea of self-efficacy. Despite the differences between Maslow and Bandura's theories, there is a considerable overlap in the observational learning and self-efficacy, or self-actualization. By realizing these similarities, a teacher could integrate these theories effectively in the classroom setting. Two psychologists and a hot tub! Yeah. The principles of a good presentation we used are clear and concise information, humor, legible visual slides, voiceover, good formatting, makeup and props, and very clear graphics. Ha, ha, ha.